Okay, 618. Let's get this potty started. Sorry about that. Oh. No worries, Dale. Thank you for, for hopping in. Okay. So the only, oh, I didn't say the only, but the uh, excused absences we have are Cheyenne, Bethany, and Lynn. And let's hop right into the meeting minutes. Were there any additions, corrections to the February 1st and or April 19th meeting minutes that were posted in the agenda? I didn't see anything wrong. Yeah, I didn't either. Uh, I move, make a motion that we approve. I'll second. second. Go ahead, Kathy. Okay. All right. All third. <laughs> great, great, great. Or simultaneous dill pickle second or something like that. Okay. So uh, any opposition? Okay. Meeting minutes for both February 1st and April 19th are approved. And moving on to new business. The revisions to the community room policy. Sarah, did you want to talk anything about that or just uh, dive right into discussion on the additions and changes? Well, let me share my screen so I can bring it up so we can look at it together. Great. Um, is it? Sorry about that. So the, um, the impetus for this change is we had a number of people using the room who want the projector and the computer. And one of them happened to mention that they were gonna show like a film. And um, so Maureen said, well, do you have the permissions to show the film? Because showing it in a library means it's a public performance, even if it's a closed meeting and all of those kinds of things. So. Um, so yes, these updates are to kind of take care of that and make sure everybody reads that. So this is in the policy. And then when we, Maureen's gonna redo the application so that it's clear on the application that if you're gonna be showing something that you have to show us information that you have the public performance rights to show it. And what does he know? That they can't show it. So they can get their, they can apply for a license to show like a commercial movie. How do they do that? Just online or they do it, expect there, us to sell, sell yeah, it to them? There are different companies who, who you can purchase a license from to show a movie. And the library has done that in the past. It's like when they do the movies in the park, they apply for a public performance rights to show it. And, and you pay a sometimes hefty fee. So will there be a handout to that could accompany the uh, application form if the person says, well, you know, I'm, I'm hoping to show a film and then you, you, know, you tell them they need these rights and say, and, and here's a way to take care of that because I think most people would be, yeah. Well, Maureen will be going back and forth with them and she can send them the information about how they could get a license. Yeah. No, I think it's a good idea. And I like your other points in there about, you know, content that gets shared with people in, you know, or that is somehow implying the city of Sandy is sponsoring this meeting mm -hmm. when, you know, it's the, you know, whatever, right. <laughs> that we wouldn't necessarily want to normally, you know, have our name attached to or something. Right. Yeah. 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 Totally yeah. Use, use the room. Mm -hmm. but, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. That, that would be my fear. Somebody show some really off the wall, oddball, extremely <laughs> controversial thing and say oh but the library they support this you know mm -hmm. they are showing it to the library yeah <laughs> <laughs> and they would not go after the person applying to use the community room they would come after the city yes oh, they yeah. would yeah and i would add sarah for mo she may 
have this, uh, and you may have this in mind as well, but uh, in the case, for example, of an independent filmmaker that we're not talking about Disney, we're not talking about Lionsgate, et cetera, that uh, it could be just a, a letter of permission uh, from the, the producer or the creator or what have you. Right. Sometimes if it's, yeah, more local things, you can get permission to show those. Like when the library has our anime club, we, we have permission to show the anime films that we're showing to the teens. Um, and that there's no cost associated with. We just, we have, but we have to apply for it, right? Mm -hmm. So that would be similar to that case, Heather. Right. Well, then, just as a question, if book club is meeting and they wanted to do a thing that was on YouTube showing, they need to get that cleared or? It depends on if it has a YouTube logo attached to it. And you can get more particulars from Maureen, but there are some YouTube videos that are produced by YouTube. Right. And those are copyrighted. But there are videos that people throw out there that are their own work, right, that are not copyrighted. But pretty much any commercial type of product that's on YouTube is either there illegally, which we wouldn't want to show in here, or is a YouTube production. Asking because we've used like an author is on and speaking about his book. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we should get that clear. You should just make sure. Yeah, yeah. You can check with Maureen and, and she can verify for you if you're unsure yeah, whether I'm you can use it or not. Because, yeah. Sure yeah. You need yeah. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Because it it seems to me that if it's uh, got a public status on YouTube, and this is as far as it's it's not uh, private, it's not uh, one that you need just to have the link for. But in other words, it is a public. Uh, video that is on YouTube, that's that's all over the internet. I mean, anybody can view that. So is the distinction, Sarah, just because it's being shown at the library? I mean, yes, because of showing it at the library makes it a public performance. So if you're just viewing it in your home, you know, one person or even 20 people, it's your private home. But at the public library, it's okay, a public, it's a public performance. Got it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Everything has to be clear. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty obvious. Yeah. <laughs> Shouldn't be. I actually. So I actually run a YouTube company. Like that's what I do for a living. I optimize YouTube channels and I make YouTube channels happen. Um, what I will say is like most people are not going to mind if it's not YouTube specific. Like if they have a public option, most people are not going to mind. But I will say, if you're going to show something in the library, it's always nice to reach out to the creator and let them know and be like, hey, can we show this? Is this cool? Because not only is it going to cover your P's and Q's and make sure everything's okay, but the creator of it's also going to be really excited. So just as a thought, if somebody wants to show something that's YouTube created, like just encourage them to read out, reach out to the creator um, and verify that it's okay to show because very few creators are going to demand money or that stuff, but it does cover our ourselves and make sure that we are doing the right thing by asking first. Thank you, Alex. Yep. Your expertise are an excellent <laughs> addition to this meeting. <laughs> and I'm very happy to know what you do. <laughs> <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, do we have any more discussion? Uh, yeah. Were there any? Questions on the content that's been added about this point to our uh, policy? I do. And I it's think just... there, there's also, uh, I know that small movie theaters, uh, when they, they deal with this copyright issue and they, they get movies to show uh, they can't ask, you know, say, okay, there's a, say, a $5 charge to come watch this movie. It's in all kind of violations of their 
their their agreements when they access those movies for public use, but they can ask for donations. Mm -hmm. And that's how these small town movie theaters are surviving as they say, we're going to sell popcorn and but we have a donation jar right here. So whatever you think you want, you know, drop in here and then enjoy the, an old time, an old movie or a, right, any movie and eat our popcorn. So we don't want people setting up in the library to show movies and then charging people. To come in and use it. Sorry about the extra noise. Yeah, I think the restrictions uh, one B and C deal with that. On the, it has you know no admission fees uh, be charged or solicited. No donations of money or other property may be solicited or collected from the audience. No promotions or sales of services, products, merchandise, materials, or other items. It's very thorough. I appreciate that. Are we okay with them using the laptop and projector? And yeah, a lot of people, I mean, we have it for people who have like a PowerPoint presentation, right? Sure. And are going to do like a talk and they have the presentation to go with it is the main reason we have it. And that's how we envisioned it being used. And mm -hmm. that's why this piece wasn't in the policy mm -hmm. until recently when we started hearing more and more people wanting to do things like that. Yes, and I can also say it's uh, been helpful. Uh, my book group used the community room over a year, about a year ago, uh, because we were live with the author of the book that we read. So we were able, thank you to the community room, we were able to meet and then uh, discuss with her uh, via Zoom, which was fabulous, really cool. I think Kathleen Drain had something she wanted to say. I did, but I, I, I'm thinking I'm getting too... Uh too stuck in the weeds. So how could you have fair use? If any showing in the library is inherently a public performance, how can you have fair use at all? I mean, you can have fair use of materials, just not formats. Or, I mean... But you're talking about performance here, right? Mm -hmm. I'm just thinking that this is, it's going to befuddle most people, right? I mean, even um, what Dale said that uh, is a good point. You know, you just want to show a YouTube event. And then as Alexander said, you know, but yes, you know, you should still probably ask the creator for the right to show it to a group. Um, but, you know, that, if it weren't being shown at the public library, that would be fair use. If no money had been collected, it would not be commercial and it would be for education, right? So that would seem to fit this. But I think what you're saying is that the public performance part seems to override fair use. And there are uncopyrighted items that would be considered fair use. The fact that it's not in my living room book club meeting, it's in this public library makes it a public performance. Yeah. Then anybody's available to, that could, you know, like if I'm not in the book club, I could still come into this meeting room, even if it was reserved for your book club and I'm not a member of your book club. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Any public program is open for anybody who wants to, or any library program is open for anybody who wants to. Do the people running the room know that? Well, that's not a library program. Right, but we still make it clear that, yes, we're in a public building. And if you're not here after hours, anybody could walk in. Mm -hmm. I withdraw whatever. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I, I don't really know how what would solve it, to be honest. I mean, well, just working with your staff and just, you know, what are you going to show and help them figure out the right way to do it? Yes. Do it one on one. Yeah. 
So you need a, a motion to accept the proposed amendments to the community room policy. I so move. I'll second it. Thank you. Moved and seconded. Do we have any opposition? Okay. Passed as so moved and seconded. All for the vote. All those in favor? Oh, she went the negative way. Yeah, it's just, yeah. Passed unanimously. <laughs> okay, next up. And we now move on to LDAC. The gift that keeps on giving. Um, <laughs> so as you know, on... Um, I've had a multi-month effort to try to refer to the Board of County Commissioners a few questions relating to how the legal structure of LDAC might or might not affect what certain libraries have been doing. So that had to do with uh, use of capital, use of district revenue for capital purposes or debt service, and then the question of how we were to be able to evaluate how cities were allocating general overhead and whether it was uh, excessive or not. And um, so I had tried over two meetings or three meetings to get some motions uh, putting these questions to the board and they were going nowhere. I could not get a consensus. I could I couldn't even wasn't clear that I even had buy in. But then curiously, when at our we had a, a meeting in May, I was ready to give it all up, but we still needed to fulfill an obligation under our um, under the internet intergovernmental agreements of indicating that we had reviewed these annual progress reports. Then the question came up, well, what does it mean to review them? And are we supposed to vote them up, vote them down? What are we supposed to do with them? Well, then all of a sudden we came around full circle and the committee agreed to send a letter to the Board of County Commissioners referring to the questions that I've been trying to refer for the past nine months. So I think um, did you? Oh, I didn't print out. We can just send it out. You can just yeah. send it as an attachment. Um, in June, well, it, after the May meeting, the chair and uh, Rick Peterson, who is the network uh, manager, worked on the draft of a letter. I volunteered to um, work with them on it and we came up with a draft that was discussed with the LDAC group at a meeting just on the 26th of June and we group edited it and agreed to text and there is a letter going to the board of county commissioners. I don't know whether it has actually been delivered yet or not but it is going to them. So that for now closes that circle. We don't know what the commissioners will do. The worst thing that could come out of this, but it's a risk we've had all along, is that they will decide that they will unilaterally amend the master order to permit use of capital. There is a way to fight that, but it is a very difficult fight. You have to get 15,000 signatures within a six week period of time if you wanted to do what is called the remonstrance. But we'll see where it goes. Um, 
I don't imagine we'll hear on this for several months. Mm -hmm. But we can now move on to the question of how do we deal with what the library district needs going forward? You know, how to, how we're going to address the questions and how we're going to make proposals. The county commissioners took out of the network budget for 23-24, an amount that had been carried to um, support this concept of the library district task force. So there is now no money for that whole task force meeting process, which was way too cumbersome anyway. But so effectively, we LDAC now needs to make a new proposal to the commissioners on how this can be done. A lot of it can be done by LDAC if we can get um, participation as needed by city managers or mayors um, so that their concerns can also be addressed as these concepts of what needs to be done get put forward. But instead of asking them to meet, you know, for a gazillion meetings over three years. Um, it, I'm hoping that what people will say is that an LDAC subcommittee will come up with an outline on governance and then have a, some meeting with either some representatives from the city managers or, you know, all of them. I don't know. I mean, this is something that has to be hashed out, but I think LDAC's efforts are not going to move to that. So I will send out a copy of the letter. I just didn't want to attach it in our agenda because I'm not sure when it's going to actually go out to the commissioners. I didn't want it to show up here before it went out to the commissioners. Mm -hmm. So that's the LDAC report. And a question on that. So not having seen the letter, I don't know quite what is being, I mean, I kind of recall some things that were mentioned and the thing that always kind of gets me um perking up and just wondering you know how does that work it's just the idea that you know every city that's taking over you know the management on behalf of Clackamas County at probably a cut rate deal that you know Clackamas County would be charging were it them running it is these overhead taps and for all the services that are provided and mm -hmm. I get that there could be a lot of variety in how those get delivered because you got Lake Oswego or you know some other folks that have quite a bit higher tax base and only one library and then you got us and we've got you know two libraries and so it's just a concern I think and so I don't know what the letter says or anything or or how that's going to be you know incorporated but that would be the one thing I'd be you know especially making sure that we're um I guess hopeful that LDAC would be again, um, supportive of the cities that are taking that responsibility on because they, you know, it's not something that they have to do legally and it does, you know, it's something that we all support. So it's common interest. We are, but let me just step back on that a little bit just for history. Kathleen is, there would be no libraries in the county if we didn't have the library district revenue, because when that passed, the county had told us they were going out of the library business, totally, totally, you know, no question. So the construct that was created was that with the city's consent, right, is that cities would be the managers of the service districts given designated to them and they would get all their tax base uh, collected within the city limits. No, then, but the city's always run the library. Right. But so I'm confused. But well, we didn't have the tax base. It's not, we're not saving the county anything. The county wouldn't engage in this, period. But it's the question is the deal when the measure was passed was that all funds would be used for services. Now, 
one of the questions that we have is what constitutes services? But the contract called for cities to be able to charge general overhead for those services directly attributable to the operation of the library. And that, of course, means all payroll, insurance, um, I can't even think of IT support. IT support, for example, right? And each city does that in a totally different formulations on how they compute those. So our charge is to make sure that the cities, and this was the fear, as they consider the district revenue a possible trough, that they could cover some extra overhead with. So our charge is to try to see that these charges are, quote, and this is the language, directly attributable to. I'm not sure you know, how we can, yeah. you know, how we can do that well. And we know that the percentages that are charged, because I did an analysis of it, runs from zero to those cities that are so rich that they fund them fully yes. to up to, I think it was 15%. So here's kind of how, when we were looking at doing a parks and rec district, what was being told to us is that, and you know, like what you see at the North Clackamas district and all, is that basically a separate district like that has to go get their own vehicles, has to go get, you know, it's, they have to hire, you know, an executive director, have HR people, have their own buildings, their own material supplies, their own vehicles, everything is their own. It's not owned by the city at all. It's not run by the city. They have right. their own board and everything. It's a different kind of district it's, than the library district is. It's similar, but different. Yeah. But that's what I'm saying is that, so that's that's the option, you know. So, so and, and I believe that, you know, we've always run it. And, and so the county was actually just helping the city, you know, helping fund the, the library. But in this case, you know, they kind of decided that they didn't want to do that anymore. And, and so, of course, you know, everybody wanted a library, but had they had every had all the city said, well, we can't afford to do that, then it would have been to it would have had to come from you know there would have been mass protests and I, there, the county would have had to back off somewhat. But I guess that's my point here is that, you know, I, I understand how everything operates, but I also know that everything, you know, the air conditioning and everything else that we have here gets delivered by the city of Sandy and gets paid for by the city of Sandy using library district money. And that has an expense in itself just to you know, pay the bills and do the HR and, you know, they have more employees and all that. And so I, and I just think that, Let you know. Let me give you an yeah. example, Kathleen. There yeah. was a library who city wanted to charge them 25% of their library district revenue as their amount. Mm -hmm. And it was a small, library and they were very concerned because they would have had to let go a bunch of staff mm -hmm. right um so those representatives came to LBAC to talk it through and strategize mm -hmm. how to approach the city yeah and then the city suddenly said oh we won't do that yeah. to you yeah so it it does happen yeah I think so what has what's, happened in the past yeah. and so what's what I assume common sense that we'd all kind of say, yeah, that makes sense, is that each city, you know, has a formula for how they assess overhead to the different departments. And, you know, just to give you an example, Mike used to complain versus, for, you know, he's got quite a, you know, not the biggest uh, workforce, but still, but he would get charged all the IT fees as if all his guys working a shovel have a, an iPad <laughs> on their hips. And they never, you know, hardly ever use the computer other than to fill out their timesheets, but he got assessed those fees. And so, but every, every city has a formula for how they assess overhead. And I think that's, so the common commonality here is that we want the cities to be able to assess fairly and, you know, accurately, as accurate as possible. They're all gonna come up with their own formulas with their own rationalizations and common sense. And somehow, you know, they all have to pay and, then, smell test. and that and so yeah piece is in yeah. the letter yeah it's it's identified that each city has their own way of doing this and you know and that's fine but what is what what amount is okay 
if that's that's what they're asking the county commissioners. Is there a are we asking the county commissioners? Is it are, so we're asking the county commissioners what is okay? Because they're the library district. They the they, they wear the, the the board, the library the district board. board. And it's another hat that they wear. Right. But okay. I mean, you know, part the part of that that's just again frustrating is they may have the boss hat on, but they have none of the responsibilities for providing all those services. And so, you know, for them to say, well, that, you know, we think it should be X, you know, well, fine, here, you provide all those services for that price. And so that's where I just kind of think they're not going to, I mean, I, I don't think they're going to respond. Yeah, that I, yeah, I, I just think they're, yeah. I mean, they could set a threshold if, if it's above 20%, it needs to be looked into maybe, you know, I mean, but yeah. that, that would be as far as they would go. And I don't even think they will do that. Yeah. That's the one concern I have is that we're, you know, and, and, and that's just me as a city councilor saying, you know, if we're doing all the work and providing all the benefits and, and but taking on all those responsibilities to have somebody else come and say, you know, Sandy and Hillland are on the low end to just right. so you are aware. Yeah. yeah. But <laughs> that said though, but we've had challenges to how much we are charging. And again, that's where, you know, we're trying to kind of fund a whole program here and, when we take it out of here, we got to, you know, give it to him or give it to them and take it out of here. So it's kind of who's off skates board. And I'm also just hesitant to kind of, you know, see the county commissioners be getting into any of the other cities that are, again, charging reasonable rates, but different rationalization. All the unincorporated revenue that the city is getting, the unincorporated folks need to are entitled to say that you're not taking more of my un unincorporated dollars than are legitimately needed, right? Because we have handed you a substantial, in the, in the case of Sandy, right? Because of the, the large population that's unincorporated that is sending revenue. That has to be thought of too. It is not just a city function. It's the fact that outside money from the unincorporated residents is being channeled to the city. And only through the library boards are those interests necessarily being thought of, you know, when the dollars are being collected. It's not just city dollars being collected, you know, for general overhead. It's also from all the unincorporated. Right. But all those, I mean, I mean I'm sure some people go to the Hoodland Library. But I'm sure quite a few on their way into work or, or home from work or whatever stopped at the city library. So we have all this unincorporated area using our city services. And yes, the library, the outside unincorporated area is paying the taxes that help us provide these services both at Hoodland exactly. and here. And so I think, you know, yeah, it's I mean, it's a it's a marvelous way for, you know, because there's so many other things that we provide dog parks and this and that that unincorporated folks get to use for free. And and, and that's and fine. Yeah. And right. You know, and, and you know, the community campus park, skate park, all that stuff will be open. We're not going to be charging for it. So, yeah. And so this is a perfect example. And I just want to make sure that, you know, we are covering our needs, you know, yeah. and it's fair and everybody's, you know, that we're providing as much service as we can. And right. going after as much dollars as we can to kind of provide the service. So that's, I think we have common interest there. I just get nervous when we're talking about other cities and how it works with them. And but you've pointed a great example of you know overreach. And and I think it's also good for the LDEC community to kind of talk about, well, here's how we calculate it based on this formula, based on FTEs or you know, yada yada, you know, in this. You know, and the legal fees and all those other things, you know, here's how we deal with those and having some, you know, shared formulas for how it gets calculated. It's probably helpful for those folks that don't have a, you know, bigger, you know, oversight or whatever, you know, staff to kind of figure all that out. I think so. Sounds like you got, you got what, you know, you got action on it. So that's really good for your perseverance. Thank you. No, because I frankly had given up. <laughs> April meeting and just said, well, this is over. You know, this is never going to happen. I was shocked. Yeah. It's not exactly, you know, 100% of what I wanted, but it is, it is so substantially there that it's, and what the goal of this is not only to let everybody know that we're watching, which is part of the purpose of this, is to let all the cities know that 
their boards and that LDAC is attentive to the use of the taxpayer revenue, but also to force this question of how do we fix this and solve it so that it works better going forward, which is, we know we need to fix this. And hopefully this helps force focus, but on the commissioner's part. Yeah. Thank you, Kathy. I'm so grateful that your faith is restored. <laughs> yes. Uh, it, it helps everyone while, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, but your your understanding, your so such a broad and thorough understanding of how all of this interplays, all the funding and percentage designations and yada yada and how it ties into the commissioners and all that i just uh thank you thank you i learn a little bit more every time you talk so, yeah. oh yeah i get that now okay and thanks for your points too kathleen i appreciate you weighing in on that with your concerns do we have any more discussion on the LDAC report from Kathy? No? Okay. Next up is our Hoodland rent memo update. So, you know, we've had the huge silence since we met on February 16th with the county administrator and the department chair. And we were told to, you know, be patient and they hope to, you know, to get us some news. So then we heard through the grapevine in May that uh, there had been an attempt to use ARPA funds to fill a $71,000 request, but that it was marked off as not being qualified. And I, I heard this through another person at LDAC who watches county paperwork all the time. So um, we checked on that. And then I asked Lynn to make a call to show, to just ask for an update, to see you know, what was going on. Then no one from his office called Lynn back, but then we found, I found out by watching the Lime Library Network budget uh, presentation uh, that Shul asked if any district revenue could be used for this. And he was uh, told that no, it could not, you know, because it didn't, doesn't fit the category of what he wanted to do. And then we heard nothing. So I emailed the county administrator's office last week, just asking for an update because knowing that we were going to come to the meeting and I was hoping that we have something to report one way or another. And I didn't hear anything. So then I called on Thursday and I was told by Ms. Larson that the administrator wants to meet, wants to set up a meeting with Mayor Pulliam and uh, Tyler and us uh, to discuss the subject. And uh, the first available meeting was sometime in uh, later July. And I said, well, I wouldn't be here. And then she said, well, then it'll go into August or Schmidt is away for the last two weeks of August or maybe into September. And I said, well, it isn't that we necessarily have to have a soon, uh, an immediate meeting as long as there's an agreement that any a uh, remedy can be retroactive to July 1. <laughs> she chuckled. Um, so I haven't heard back. She said she was going to send an email out or a doodle. Now I can follow up with Tyler. And uh, Did you ask him? Or This was just last Thursday. Oh, okay. Yes. Yes. Do you want to follow up or do you want me to do anything? Maybe. Follow up with Stan. Right. I, can, I can follow up. Why don't you follow up with Tyler and I'll follow up with Stan. But it's also possible that they, they just couldn't get the scheduling done. I think she was going away this week. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, I suggested to her that she do a doodle. Mm -hmm. You know, I said, yeah. it sounds like an awful lot of people to try to get on to, yeah. you know. Summer's a busy time when everybody's on vacation. So yeah. 
that's all I can report is that Schmidt has asked for a meeting, but we don't know why and where it's going. Uh -huh. Will there be somebody from Schultz's office? I mean, if he's our advocate, it would be helpful to have an advocate, I would think, from him, from that. Because Schmidt is, you know, I don't I don't quite know how that works. And, you know, maybe that'll be something to ask, you know. I, she, uh, yeah. she might have listed yeah. him or not. She yeah. was, or just even she his, was his, you know, you know yeah. she was yeah. trying to get a lot of stuff done right. before she went on vacation. <laughs> right. um, well, I guess when we see the list, we can always ask that he be yeah. invited. Yeah, or his representative, yeah. Because right. I think, because otherwise then it's kind of, He's like, oh, well, I'm, I'm going to take this to the board. And it's like, you know, it'd be nice to have the local board, you know, representative there. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, I mean, they still have mm -hmm. to kind of go through the rest of the board and might have a different opinion about that. But at least they get, they're in the room where the, where the, where the stuff happens, whatever Hamilton's song is. <laughs> in the room where it happened. <laughs> And uh, when Lynn gets back, we can always ask her to check in with Shul's office again, maybe. Yeah. Since she's been in contact with their office. Well, you talk to Tyler and I'll talk to uh, Stan and kind of ask him, you know, he's pretty tight with Shul. So. so indeed, is that uh, the case that Shul is uh, our advocate, if you will, on this matter? You know, I would think he probably is. I have to say that when I was walk, you know, I, I would watch all these hearings in part to see what was going on with the Gladstone and the Oak Lodge libraries because, you know, over the past year we haven't actually known how the funding was going to happen for that. Were they going to pull the rug on them? What what was going on? And at all of the instances where the commissioners have had to vote on the funding for those two libraries. Sure, well, you know, shaking his finger and saying, now, you know, there won't be any more money, you know, doing the conservative thing, has heartily voted in favor of supporting the libraries. So there's no reason to believe that he's not. Well, and he's a Sandy resident. Right. I don't know if you knew that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so we he, is? Kind of, and he used to come into yeah. the library yeah. years ago. Yeah. I mean, he was a regular yeah. coming into the library. So <laughs> I, I think so. Have any of them been up to the Woodland Library ever? I doubt it. There's an invitation that needs to be addressed in the meeting that happens. Mm -hmm. yeah. Or before. Or before yeah, the or meeting. Maybe, 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 maybe you should, should have the meeting up there. Up there to, have the meeting up there. To see it. That'd be interesting. Have the meeting there. At the, do you have a meeting room up there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's not very big. It's a big room. All the more That's reason the we should have it there. <laughs> no, we have, have stacks of books on the floor. <laughs> no, we have buttonholed uh, Shul and just, you know, I like think we had this dinner and he was there. I sat right next to him and buttonholed him a little bit, talked to him about the library stuff and Stan's done that. So I think, you know, he's, I think, supportive of libraries has, you know, just, yeah. So he's probably a good advocate to have and can help carry the water with the rest of the board. So. Right, right. And Savas is the uh, board member who comes to the LBAT meetings. But I have not brought this issue up with Savas because it really struck me as it was uh, better in Schulz Lane. Um, I'm, I'm sure Savas would be supportive, but it seemed like Schulz might be the better advocate. And so we've been letting him uh, do that contact. Have you met him, Alexandra? I have not. Maybe next time, uh, if Lynn knows that he's going to be up there, you know, maybe you can corral him too. That sounds great. I'd love that. Just a thought. Yeah. That's all. Stay tuned. <laughs> Thanks for that. Any other new business or old business? I had one thing. Um, so for many months, I don't know, probably longer, I, I don't, since I retired, I don't 
get up early in the morning. I mean, I get up early in the morning, but I don't get in my car and go anywhere. So, uh, but, you know, I've heard from other city councilors and stuff that they were frustrated with um, the homeless kind of sleeping out in front of the library. I don't know if you guys knew that, but it was fairly steady thing. And, and, you know, I'd drive by after a city council meeting and they'd be set up there, you know, doing this, you know, <laughs> and of course we're offering, you know, free Wi-Fi here all night long. And so it's a very attractive place to be. Wi-Fi able. is turned off at 8 p.m. Yeah. Well, so that, you know, I'm just kind of letting them know is kind of what happened because that it just kind of got to be so, to the point where they, you know, the reason they're here is for the Wi-Fi. And so some of the city councilors suggested to the staff that we turn it off at eight o'clock. And I know that's, you know, hard, but it's just hard to, um, you know, we offer so many services, but when it becomes a problem where, you know, the reason the homeless are here, staying in right in front of the library in a very visible place, which is against our camping regulations, we just felt like it would be um, a better um, thing. So we did recommend that they turn it off. And so they did. And it, we haven't had, I haven't seen, you know, I've gone by a couple of times in the evening and haven't seen any. Has there been much of a problem? Well, the Wi Fi has been turned off at 8 p.m. for years. Years. Yeah. It, I mean, I came, came by at 9 30 a couple of times after budget meetings and whatever and was able to surf the net. Or you, you could have been using yourself, though. Because no, it was Wi Fi. I got on my Wi Fi. That's interesting because we had we had the signs in the windows even that said Sandy Net, um, seven a.m. to eight p.m. and that was in all city areas. I don't know that it was work. I don't know. I mean, like I said, I I looked at the sand, you know, Sandy guest, you know, and I got on it, and that was like nine thirty after. We don't have a Sandy guest. Well, it was um. It was something that I forget what it was. I mean, there's I have several Sandy Wi-Fi that I can connect to, but it was okay. So it was probably another uh, another connection, Kathleen. Well, I don't know. It said you know it said the Sandy one. So and I and like I said, it was kind of a coincidence that once we kind of piped up about it, that did it make you accept the Sandy Net policy? Uh huh. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And so Greg said that he came over and dealt with it and so I don't know if it was maybe just not turned on or something was misset or something like that okay. so anyways you're under the impression that it hasn't been past 8 p.m for years but why would they be over here sleeping well, in front of the library there's two outlets at the front of the library one one outlet with two plugs in it at the front of the library that we can't disconnect because the rest of the lighting system is on the same one but you all of the a, other ones can you put a lock on it we had lock boxes on all of them and they just take them off. I mean, they had, they unscrew screws and I mean, all kinds of stuff like that. So the other, like maybe last week, somebody noticed that one of them looked like they had been tampered. Yeah. I saw the closed ones yeah. and it had been. Yeah. And, and so they're right. They're regularly. Yeah. There's ways to kind of yeah. do vandal resistant hardware and, and things yeah. like that. Yeah. So we're work considering side. that for that front yeah. outlet. Yeah. I mean, we need a few outlets on the building so that we can like, plug in a power washer right or exactly you know, outdoor right. equipment yeah. that we need to use yeah so but there's ways to kind of yeah. meet, meet your needs and also not you know it's just hard because we're just you know it's just kind of when you offer free power and free wi-fi and you know, there's a lot of pressure coming from portland now and we have a one dollar bus with wi-fi on it you right. know so we're just trying to kind of you know you know, and, and that said, we want to try to offer services and do all those other things to try to kind of solve the actual problem. Um, but we also don't want to do things that are, in, you know, for the people that are not interested in services, you know, we want to make it, you know, a little bit less fun. To, the <laughs> difficult thing for library staff is that generally those houseless people show up after the library is already closed and all staff have gone home and they generally left in the morning before staff we're here. Mm -hmm. So we don't even, I mean, it's not really a library issue, right? Mm -hmm. Because the, when the library is open and everybody's coming in, yeah, they're not there. It's so, more a visibility thing. Yeah. And it's like, you know, everybody going to work in the morning sees it, everybody, you know, after 6 p.m., 7 p.m., whatever sees it, you know, and so it's just, yeah. Yes. And so it's a, and I, you know, and yeah, I think, um, you know, we've got some areas where they can camp that don't have plugs and all that, but they have the ability to camp. So I'm, 
you know, concerned that we provide an outlet. For, uh, let me. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. <laughs> not, 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 but... <laughs> so, yeah. Right. So, anyways, that was you know just something that we're trying to kind of keep an eye on because we were getting we were getting comment. Uh, did you get see the stuff from the public? Yeah. I did. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So when it's you know when we start getting pictures sent to us from the public and all, it's something that we have to act on. So, um, yeah. Which is also why we put the fence up in the back of yeah. the library right here. You know we. It's, you know, once one thing happens, they move somewhere else and mm -hmm. have to deal with it there. Whack them all. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I mean, I, it just kills me to hear, hear people say, you know, they won't go to Mining Park. They won't go to Fantasy Forest because of the issues that they have there. And, you know, I just don't want it to be like that. I want our parks to be welcoming and safe and clean. And ours. yeah. Yeah. There I'm, is sorry. I'm sorry. This is really upsetting to me. We are talking about people and houseless people. And can we just like stop talking about them? Like they're just like a problem. I get there. I get they have issues and we have issues with them. But like the way you're talking about them right now is really upsetting. Like people go to the parks. Well, houselessness is a big issue, not just in Oregon, across the country. And I just, I'm really not comfortable with the way this conversation is going right now. If we can address it in a different way, that's fine. But we are talking about these people that they're not people right now, and I don't like that. Sorry. Thank you, Alex. Um, I was going to say that um, we have ODHS, DHS in the building twice a week to help people. And um, the new housing coordinator for Ant Farm came by today to introduce herself. Um, and you know, generally, Ant Farm works with youth, um, and they consider youth up to age 24. Um, but they have gotten additional funding to help um, support oh, housing, so yeah. Help, yeah, to yeah. Help support yeah. housing services for adults. Yeah. So that is good news. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Alex, I'm sorry. I apologize if that came across negative or as a problem. It's uh, it's it's devastating to see people in this situation. My daughter lives down on Burnside by Providence Park. So I visit her, you know, a couple times a week and, and see, you know, every, and she, you know, she lives it every day and works at the Fred Myers there. And, and it, it is hard to see people in such pain and, and hurting. And so it's, you know, I don't know if you call it a problem. I, I call it a, just, you know, a tragedy that we have folks living on our streets and, you know, and it's tragedy for all of us that we allow that. And the city council is trying to work with trying to um, help lean some of these supportive services with Ant Farm and all that and try to kind of come bring services together. Um, and I myself have cleaned up, you know, numerous homeless camps, you know, coolers full of poop and pee. So I'm like, you know, for, I know what, you know, what all's involved. And, and me as a parks advocate and a trails advocate, my concern is that when we have um, homeless people living in our parks, then it makes it so that people don't want to have another park built or another trail built because they're, you know, because it, it's like, you know, oh, we can't have that. We can't link up to this, the Casadero over there because it'll be spring water. You know, this trail will be spring water. So people are so fearful of that happening. And so, you know, I'm trying to kind of make sure that we, we all have parks and trails where we feel, you know, that we can, homeless people can use them too, you know, everybody can use them and feel safe and, and welcome. And, and, and that said, I don't support having people living in our parks or on our trails because of that situation. I do believe in giving every, everybody as much help and support services and getting as much money to provide these services and being compassionate and empathetic and all that. So that's, if that came across differently, I apologize. That's not at all what I meant to say. I really appreciate you saying this. Um, please understand, like my mother worked for Parks and Rec for 25 years. She retired in February in Montana and she dealt with a lot of homelessness. Uh, a homeless man was killed in my hometown the other day by teenagers because oh. they treated them like they, they, yeah, they, they beat him to death um, because he was just treated like he didn't matter. So I am very sensitive about the subject and I appreciate what you're saying that people don't want to use parks, but um, I just don't want us to ever discuss, we are a library board and libraries are for everybody's use. Libraries are a publicly funded thing that should be available to everyone, including our houseless population. 
So the minute we start to talk about um, the idea that like we should shut off internet and like do these things to like prevent people from using it, like I understand the reasons we do that, but I also just want to make sure that we are still treating these people like they're humans and not dehumanizing them. Sorry, I, I know Amen. that's like a pretty intense thing for a meeting, <laughs> but that's part of the reason I signed up for the, for the library board is my past experience with like dealing with the houseless population in libraries. Good points, I agree. Thank you, Alexandra. And thank you, Kathleen, too. Appreciate the viewpoints. And that is what I was gonna to say too, is that the, the houseless uh, community members, they are part of our service district. And uh, for them to abuse uh, what we offer, that's a different story. But indeed, uh, it's our services and offerings are not to their exclusion or any other population for that matter. Any more discussion? I have a few staff updates, Heather. Great, thank you. Um, so Tyler's name has come up a couple times and since our last meeting, I believe he has been um, named interim city manager um, and the city council is actively working on recruiting um, for the city manager position. Um, it sounds like maybe September will be interviews. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the, the week of the 7th, I think. Okay. Uh, 7th to the 14th or something like that. Perfect. Maybe a little later, yeah. We'll, we'll be kind of interviewing and stuff and narrowing it down. And then like up to the 16th, I think is when they, but I think they're going to want it, you guys to be, you know, also involved in that. So right. glad to hear that. Yeah. Um, and then the library is going to be in the Mountain Festival Parade tomorrow. Um, I can pull out one of these snazzy parts. You may be able to see it. <laughs> we are going to be, we have our banner skinny of the libraries. And let's see, you know, I can get this out of this crazy thing. <laughs> <Very bad. laughs> um, we have six book carts and we will be doing a book cart routine. Um, so, <laughs> Choreographs? Yeah. <laughs> so if you have a chance to come to the parade, it's at 7 p.m. tomorrow night. And it should be lots of fun. You know where you are in the... Uh, we are the number five in the lineup. Woo. Okay, so we have to get somebody to video the uh, dance drill cart routine performance. Yes, I think um, Chris's husband, Kurt, had did it in previously, and I think he plans to be there to, to oh, do some video again. Um, but if any of you want to come, you're welcome to take your own video and we can utilize it to, to show everyone our exciting part, our entry in the parade. So, so we have the banner, um, people carrying the banner and a few people walking and then the cart drill team. And then um, one of my staff has a classic Jeep. It's like from the 1950s maybe, and it's an open air Jeep. And so we'll have a few people dressed as characters. Um, so the theme of the parade this year is America. So we've got maybe a Betsy Ross and uh, Uncle Sam who will be sitting in the Jeep. So. Great. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna be in it too. My first time in the parade. Oh, all right. eight years with the Did park. you say what your slope to what your position is in the parade number? We're number five. five. Number five, okay. Mm -hmm. Right at the front. Yeah, right. So I think that is it. Unless... No, it's not. There's more news. What other news does the library have after the budget meeting? Oh, the... what will you be driving in the parade yeah, next well, year? Uh, hopefully, um, the bookmobile. So an update about the bookmobile. So the model that we wanted to purchase, um, they're no longer making. And it was much less expensive than everything else that's out there currently. So um, I think me and Rebecca are gonna go to the Bookmobile Conference in October. It's in Hershey, Pennsylvania. 
Um, and so all the bookmobile vendors will be there so we can meet with them to figure out what exactly we want and how to get the best deal. Um, but yeah, and then I've got a sort of a lead on a grant application that we might be able to do to find some more funding for it. Um, we do have money in our contingency for the library that we might be able to utilize. So hopefully we can sort of cobble together the resources we need because we only got $150,000 approved because that was the model we wanted. Um, so. Is there any used? <laughs> like, do you have used bookmobiles available? I used bookmobiles out there. I don't know if that's I, a good purchase to yeah. make. I wouldn't think they have a lot of miles on them. Yeah. <laughs> They mostly stay in communities. Most of the used bookmobiles are like bus size. Um, and I'm hoping for a more of a van size so that any staff member can drive it. We don't have to have a CBL to drive it, right? So yeah, but I've been looking into that option as well. Right. So does the money have to be spent by a certain time? We have it for this budget cycle, so two years. Two years. Oh, okay. So and we should start the spend by no. next day. No. So we should be able to, to get it done within that two year frame, hopefully. But it's just a little more difficult, of course, than I was expecting. Well, good. Yeah. Well, hopefully we'll have one in next year's parade. Yeah, that would be great. That would be great. Yeah. yeah. Great news. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. All these turnarounds, right? We get like, oh, dang it. <laughs> like, LDAC, forget it. You know, the whole rent thing, that's over. And and then no bookmobile. And then I like all these turnings. Yeah. It's exciting stuff. Which is, uh, I think, a good teaching reminder that uh, the old, you know, it ain't over till it's really over. Yeah. And even when we think it's over, it might not be over. Yeah. <laughs> Persistence pays off for sure. All right. Yep. Keeping the vision in line. Okay. Anything else to add? I think that's it. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for being here tonight. Have a fabulous trip, Alexandra. Be safe. Thank you. And anyone else who's in the travel mode upcoming. And uh, you'll be in touch with us, Dara, regarding uh, an August meeting, I presume. Yep. Or, or a not meeting. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see if we need one. Okay, great. So can I get a motion to adjourn the meeting at 721? So moved. Okay. Kathy moved. I'll second it. And Dale Scobert seconded. Thank you.